Snookle by Paul Jennings. Snookle was delivered one morning with the milk. There were four half-litre bottles. Three of them contained milk and the other held Snookle. He stared sadly at me from his glass prison. I could see he was alive, even though he made no sign or movement. He reminded me of a dog on a chain that manages to make its owner feel guilty simply by looking unhappy. Snookle wanted to get out of that milk bottle, but he didn't really expect it to happen. He didn't say anything, he just gazed silently into my eyes. I placed the three full bottles in the fridge and put Snookle in his small home on the table. Then I sat down and looked at him carefully. All I could see was a large pair of gloomy eyes. He must have had a body, but it was nowhere to be seen. The eyes simply floated in the air about 15 centimetres above the bottom of the bottle. Mum and Dad had already left for work, so I wouldn't get any help from them. I gave the bottle a gentle shake, and the eyes bounced around like a couple of small rubber balls. The gloomy expression was replaced by one of alarm, and the eyes blinked a number of times before settling back into their original position. Oh, sorry, I said. I didn't mean to hurt you. There was no reply, just a long, reproachful look. Where did you come from? I asked. And how did you get here? What sort of creature are you? What is your name? I received no reply to my question. In fact, the eyes began to close. He was falling asleep. A nasty thought entered my mind. What if he was dying? There's no, not much air in a milk bottle. He might be suffocating. If he was an air-breathing creature. I thought about opening the bottle and letting him out. But if I did, I could be in for trouble. He might not go back into the bottle, and he could be dangerous. He, he might bite me or give me some terrible disease that would kill off the whole human race. He might nick off, spreading death and disease wherever he went. I went over to the window and looked outside. Maybe one of the kids from school would be passing. Two heads would be better than one, especially if the thing in the bottle attacked me. Then I remembered. Ugh, it was correction day, there was no school. Only person in the street was poor old Mrs. McKee who was hobbling down her steps to get the milk. She wouldn't be any help. She had arthritis, and it was all she could do to pick up one bottle of milk at a time. It took her half an hour to shuffle back to the front door from the gate. Some weekends I used to go and do jobs for Mrs. McKee, because her hands were so weak that she couldn't do anything by herself. Her garden was overgrown with weeds, and her windows were dirty. All the paint was peeling off the house. I once heard Mum say that Mrs. McKee would have to go into an old folks home soon because her fingers wouldn't move properly. No, Mrs. McKee wouldn't be any use if the eyes in the bottle turned nasty. I looked at my visitor again. His eyelids were beginning to droop. At any moment he might be dead. I decided to take the risk. With one, with one swift movement I took the metal cap off the bottle. The expression in the eyes changed. They looked happy. Then they started to move slowly up to the neck of the bottle. I could tell the cr little creature was climbing up the glass even though I couldn't see his body. The eyes emerged from the bottle and floated in the air just above the rim. He sat on top of the bottle, staring at me happily. I couldn't see his mouth or any part of his face, but I knew he was smiling. What's your name? I asked. It might seem silly to talk to an unknown creature as if it could answer, but I had a feeling that he would understand me. Even so, I got a shock when he did answer. He didn't use words or speech. I could hear him inside my brain. The word Snookle just sort of drifted into my mind. Who are you, Snookle? I said. And what do you want? Again, he answered without talking. His reply melted into my thoughts. I am your servant. Your every thought is my command. They weren't his exact words because he didn't use words, but it was more or less what he meant. Especially the bit about every thought being his command. That was the next thing I found out. He could read my thoughts. He knew what I wanted without me saying anything. My stomach suddenly rumbled. I was hungry. The eyes floated across the table and over to the pantry. Snookle could fly. The next thing I knew, a packet of cornflakes in a bowl flew slowly back with the eyes following close behind. Then the fridge opened and the milk arrived the same way. The cornflakes and the milk were tipped into the bowl. Sugar added. Just the right amount and just the way I liked it. This was great! He knew I wanted breakfast, and he got it for me without being told. I didn't eat it straight away, because I like my cornflakes a bit soggy. I decided to try Snookle out on something else. 
thought about bringing in the papers from the letterbox. Snookle floated over to the front door and opened it. Then he stayed there, hovering in the air. Go on, I said. Out you go. The eyes moved from side to side. He was shaking his head. I looked out the door and saw a man riding by on his bike. As soon as the cyclist had passed, Snookle flew out and fetched the papers. I knew what had happened. Snookle didn't want anyone to see him except his master. I was his master because I'd let him out of the bottle. He would only show himself to me. I went back to my bedroom, followed by Snookle. He preferred altitude was about two metres off the ground. Decided to wear my stretch jeans as there was no school that day. The moment the thought entered my mind, Snookle set off for the wardrobe. My jeans, t-shirt and underwear were delivered by airmail and laid out neatly on the bed. The next bit, however, gave me a bit of a surprise. Snookle pulled off my pyjamas and started to dress me. I felt a bit weird. It was just like a little kid being dressed by his mother. I could feel long, thin, cold fingers touching me. Hey, cut it out, Snookle, I said. You don't have to dress me. He didn't take any notice. That was when I found out that Snookle helped you whether you wanted it or not. My nose was itchy. I could feel a sneeze coming on. As quick as a flash, Snookle whipped out my handkerchief out of my pocket and held it up to my nose. I sneezed into the handkerchief and said, Hey, thanks, but that wasn't necessary. I went back to the kitchen for my breakfast. Snookle beat me to the spoon. I tried to grab it off him, but he was too quick for me. He dipped the spoon into the cornflakes and pushed it into my mouth. I tried to stop him by keeping my lips closed, but he prized them open with his chilly little invisible fingers and shoved the next spoonful in. He fed me the whole bowl of cornflakes, just as if I was a baby. Now, I hope you understand about the next bit. And I'm not really a nose picker, but I have thought about it now and then. My nose was still a bit itchy, and the thought just came into my mind to pick it. I wouldn't have done it any more than you would. Anyway, before you could blink, this cold, invisible finger went up my nose and picked it for me. Snookle was picking my nose! I nearly freaked out. I screamed and tried to push him off, but he was too strong. After that, things just got worse and worse. Snookle wouldn't let me do a thing for myself, not a single thing. Went back to the kitchen and sat down. This wasn't working well at all. I could see my future looming in front of me with Snookle doing everything for me. Everything. He had to go, and quick. I dropped a cornflake into the empty milk bottle and thought hard about getting it out. Snookle floated over and went into the bottle to get it out. I moved like greased lightning and put the top back at the bottle before Snookle knew what had hit him. He was trapped. He didn't even try to get out. He just looked at me with sad, mournful eyes, as if he had expected nothing better. Now I was in a fix. I didn't want to leave Snookle on the bottle for the rest of his life, but I didn't want him hanging around picking my nose for me either. I looked out of the window. Poor old Mrs. McKee had managed to get back to the house with one of her bottles of milk. Soon she would make the slow trip back to the letterbox for the next one. I picked up Snookle, and I slowly crossed the road. Then I put his bottle down outside Mrs. McKee's house. I grabbed her full bottle of milk with one hand and waved goodbye to Snookle with the other. His eyes stared silently and sadly back at me. That was the last I ever saw of Snookle. Over the next few days, a remarkable change came over Mrs. McKee's house. The grass was cut, the flower beds were weeded, the windows were cleaned, and someone even repainted the house. People in the street thought it was strange because they never saw anyone doing any work. I went over to see Mrs. McKee about a week later. She looked very happy. Very happy indeed.